So we're coming to the end of uh, 1 John. And what I wanted to do tonight uh, was just to share with you for a few minutes. I want to leave some time for discussion at the end. Um, I, I just... I just went through and I found what I would call refrigerator verses. They're all on this handout right here. And I say refrigerator verses because these are some of our, my favorite verses from 1 John. And I think there'll be a particular encouragement to you. Um, and, and what I did is, is I reached out to my daughter-in-law, Malia, who does graphic design. And I said, could you do me a favor and make this look pretty? I sent the verses to her and I said, could you make this look pretty? Because you ladies aren't going to hang this on your refrigerator unless it looks pretty. I could go to men's ministry and practically my own handwriting write it out and they'd be fine with it. But so, so she, made it, she made it look pretty. And you'll notice the word at the top is the word love. And the reason I chose that um, as a theme for tonight is I went through and I grabbed six key verses uh, that include the word love in them. You might say, well, why, why did you pick that out? Because John the Apostle wrote 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, Revelation, but he also is the man that wrote the Gospel of John, and he is known as the Apostle of Love. In fact, it's interesting, but the Gospel of John has 57 different times that it mentions the word love in it. And what's fascinating about that is that's more than the other three Gospels combined. In fact, it's John that wrote the words, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. In fact, my Bible down there is the Bible that my first grade Sunday school teacher gave me in 1974. I brought it over to show the kids over here tonight. I think they think I was alive when Abraham Lincoln was alive. They're like, 1974? I'm like, yeah, I rode my horse to church. (laughs) The truth of the matter is I grew up in Simi Valley and Mr. Frankino used to pick us up with the horse and buggy. We literally rode a horse to church. I know, it's kind of crazy. I was so excited the year they finally got a bathroom at that church. So... You know, like running water, all of that. Yeah. We never did take the buggy through McDonald's drive through but. but it's interesting because 57 times in the Gospel of John, John mentions love. John is also called the disciple Jesus loved. That's how he refers to himself. And then, and then in the book of 1 John, did you know 46 times the word love shows up in that one little five-chapter book of the Bible? 46 different times. Now, when you're doing Bible study, one of the things that's good to do is to see if a word's repeated often. And many times that will help you to know what's the uh, authorial intent. What did the author intend to emphasize? In fact, you're going to see that this weekend um, at church. We're going to be in 2 Timothy 1, verses 8 to 18. And the Apostle Paul mentions the word ashamed three different times. And so my sermon title this week is Unashamed. So that's going to be a theme because you see that over and over. So the, the theme of love is really clear in the heart of John, the disciple Jesus loved. It it's, it's comes through in his gospel. It comes through in the book of 1 John. And so um, it's actually interesting. I mentioned her name this morning. I had no idea uh, what was going to happen in her life. But Tina Turner, who passed away today, of all things, at the age of 83, um, had this song called What's Love Got to Do With It? I have no idea what that song's talking about, but nonetheless, that comes to my mind when I'm, and and when you think of the gospel, when you think of the God of the universe, when you think of the Bible and you ask that question, what's love got to do with it? The answer is everything. Love, it's everything. Like it is a love letter. When I was in seminary, I had a professor, his name is Hubert Hartzler. What a name. I mean, if your last name's Hartzler, why did your parents name you Hubert? But then again, my grandpa's name was Noise, so I, I'm not sure what, you know, they didn't always get it right in those days. But Hubert Hartzler told a story one time about his brother going to a college class and the biology teacher, which I had a similar experience, said, I don't want to hear from any of you Christians in this room. So you just keep your mouth shut. And so his brother on the first day of class raises his hand, can I ask you why? I'm a Christian. Can I ask you why? He, he just violated the rule. And they started going back and forth, debating scripture, debating truth. And this was exactly, I mean, the college professor was asking for it. And so finally his brother, probably not the best move in the world. You kind of get it though. He just says, I think I know the problem. And he goes, well, what's the problem? He goes, the Bible's a love letter to his children. And you're reading somebody else's mail. (laughs) The Bible is a love letter. It's a love letter. I still have the love letters that Kristen used to send me when we were teenagers. They're in a box. It's a stereo box that from Sears, a car stereo, cassette stereo that she got me for my 17th birthday. And I've kept them all in that box. I still have them. I'm not showing them to my kids. They can look at them when I'm dead. So I've kept them though, but they're hidden away. 
They've never read them. She really sprayed them with perfume. <laughs> Ooh, pretty big deal for 17. Maybe not a good idea. But the Bible's a love letter. And I hope that when you read it, you read it that way. I know sometimes you get to certain parts of the Bible, you're like, wow, this seems pretty heavy. But understand, that's the overall, there's one story. And the story's about a God who so loved the world, who so loved you, that he sent his son Jesus to redeem you, to pay for you, to pay the punishment that you and I deserved so that you could be his. So tonight what I've done is I've just taken six verses from 1 John that are based on love, and I just wanna go through them with you briefly. And look at the first one, if you would. It says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And so, first of all, we see this love that God hates. He hates it when his kids love that which those who hate him. Really what I'm saying is this, is, is we have a love relationship with our God and what he's calling us to here is fidelity, to faithfulness, like a, a relationship between a husband and a wife and a, a husband who would so love his wife as Christ loved the church that he would be faithful to her. Don't love the world. He's saying, don't love the world. I rescued you from that world. When it says don't love the world, it doesn't mean you can't enjoy material things in the world. That's not the point. It's not a call to asceticism, like I just can't enjoy anything. Because after all, the God who made you and loves you is a good father, and he actually has given you all things to enjoy. There's nothing wrong. But, but when you start to love those things in the world more than you love him, they become idols, then you no longer are really loving him. What we do is in those moments is we become more like Gomer in the Old Testament. Remember Gomer, the wife of Hosea? Remember Hosea, the prophet? God says, you go marry this prostitute and she's gonna be unfaithful to you and that's gonna be an example of my relationship with Israel. I've loved Israel, I've rescued Israel and yet Israel's repeatedly unfaithful to me. And what, what we're seeing here in this verse is don't love the world. It's like, don't love the world, love me. I bought you, I redeemed you. I meet with men every Saturday morning, as I mentioned this weekend, and it's funny, but we went through this section uh, in the second or third week, and it's on identity. And, I, and you know, just remind the men that, you know, your identity, you're a servant of God, you're a son of God, you're, you've been adopted as a son or daughter, we're gonna talk about that in just a minute. Uh, you're, you're a friend of Jesus, Jesus calls you his friend, but then the last one, men always struggle with. You're a lover. The Bible describes us that way, that we're the bride of Christ, that we're his lover. And I know that that's just, for men, that's just like, I don't know if they picture themselves like in a wedding dress, and that's just hard for them to get around that. But I'll tell you what, one of my favorite, my, one of my favorite things ever to do when I do weddings in this room, my favorite part of the wedding is I'm standing here, the groom is here, the wedding party's all in the room, and now we're just waiting for that bride to enter right through those doors. Amy Weiser is really good. She makes it really dramatic. They start the wedding march, but she never sends the bride right away. She's creating this, I was gonna say a pregnant pause, but that's not something you wanna think about at a wedding. So anyhow, scratch that from what I just, I didn't say that. So, so the, the doors will fly open and then here comes the bride. And in that moment, it never fails. The groom just starts crying. And I always love that. I always look over and I'm like, you wimp. I'll say that to him, but the mic is off. But I'm like, I actually look at him and say, pretty sweet moment, huh? And then during that service, we'll a lot of times do communion right back here later in the service. I turn my microphone off and I'll just stand back here and I'll, and I'll serve them communion and I'll take that cup and I'll say to that young man, before, before he even serves his wife, his new wife-to-be, that cup, I'll just say, this is the blood. This represents the blood of Jesus. He purchased this woman here that you're next to for God. So that makes God your new father-in-law. Jesus loves her, don't mess with her. Because if you do, you're messing with the God of the universe. Because that's her Abba. That's her daddy. You see, there's this cool story in the Bible. And it's about a woman who comes and approaches Jesus and starts to anoint his feet with oil. Jesus is in the house of this man named Simon. Simon's a Pharisee, not Simon Peter. This is Simon the Pharisee. And Simon has Jesus into his house for a meal, but Simon doesn't really have a lot of respect for Jesus, doesn't wash his feet like would be the custom to do. And while they're lounging there, and usually they would have dinner like in an open courtyard, a woman approaches who's called a woman of the city, a prostitute. And she starts to, she takes this alabaster flax out and she starts to anoint Jesus' head with oil and her tears and with her hair. And Simon says, if he was really a prophet, he would know 
what scum this woman is, and there's no way he would let her touch him. And Jesus then tells a cool little story about forgiveness, and then he says this, he who's been forgiven much loves much. You see, when you read this verse, do not love the world or the things in the world, really what it's saying is, it's God's appeal to you to say, love me. Have you been forgiven much? I have. If you've been forgiven much, love much. Love much. Just love your, your savior. Don't love the world. Well, the second verse, and I love this verse, is 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason the world doesn't know us is it didn't know him. The word see there is literally a word like behold. It's meant to cause you to pause all the great things. And you read them. You studied them. You read in 1 John chapter 1 and chapter 2. Now you get to chapter 3. And, and it's as if, as if John's going, now all of that's been good, but this gets really good. Behold. See this. Pay attention. And in the Old Testament, the word Selah, like in the book of Psalms, means to pause, stop, ponder. Psalm 32, after David's sin with Bathsheba, he says, how blessed is the one whose sins are forgiven. Selah. I, I saw somebody yesterday, I think they have like their fifth, fifth or sixth kid, and they named the baby Selah. And I looked at this lady, it was a brand new baby, first time I'd seen the baby, and I just said, you know, Selah means pause. It doesn't mean stop, so keep on going. She said, oh no. I said, next kid, name it Stop. So pause and think about this, ladies. The kind of love the Father has given to you. The word father there means you're his daughter, that we should become children of God. There's this other really great story in the Bible of another lady in Mark chapter five. And it's the lady, you're gonna remember her, the lady with the blood issue. 12 years. In that society, you were unclean ceremonially, so you had to literally be ostracized from everybody around you. So it's not just that she had a physical ailment and would be anemic and always weak and feeling terrible, but not only that, but, but nobody would associate with her. So she sneaks up behind Jesus, touches his garment, and she's healed. And Jesus says, who touched me? But here's what I want you to catch. The only time Jesus in the Gospels refers to a woman as daughter is in this moment. And he says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Now, what do you think this lady was feeling in that moment when Jesus says, daughter? He doesn't say, disgusting. He says, daughter. See what kind of love the Father has given to you that you would be daughters of God. That's, that's who you are. That's your true identity. Let's look at the third one. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and for our sisters, 1 John 3, 16. In John 15, 13, Jesus says, greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. In John chapter 10, verse 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and I lay down my life for my sheep. Love, true love, is sacrifice. It's not talk. Talk is cheap. True love is action. In fact, there's an old poem, it goes like this. Uh, a, a song is not a song until you sing it, and a bell is not a bell until you ring it, and love is not love until you give it away. True love will always cost you. It costs Jesus, it will cost you. What are you willing to do for your sisters in Christ in this room? What price are you willing to pay to serve them? Jesus says, as I have loved you, you must love one another. Do you know who this reminds me of in the Bible? It reminds me of Ruth. Don't you love Ruth? Remember Ruth and Naomi? Remember Ruth is the Moabitess and she marries Naomi's son and her son is, her husband is killed and her sister-in-law's husband's killed and so is their dad. And so Naomi's just like bitter and she says, I, my, my life's over, but you're young. So you need to go back to your people so you can find a husband and find a life and I release you. And, and remember what she says, nope, nope, nope. Where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. I am not gonna leave you behind. And remember she goes then to Boaz's field and collects the gleanings. That was basically the welfare of the day, but you had to go actually pick it up and bring it. And it, it involved a, a lot of work. And then she ends up marrying Boaz right? You remember the whole story. And she ends up being the grandma to King David. Like it's an incredible story. But what I want you to catch is this, is she had a true loyal love. In the Old Testament, the word that's used for love most of the time is hesed, H-E-S-E-D, hesed. And that means a loyal love, sacrificial love. 
It's agape. That's the word that's used here in John over and over and over. It's agape love. Literally, the word means charity. It means to give. Our world is so cheap, isn't it, when it comes to love? Like now even some people in their marriage vows are saying, until love do us part. Love is so much more than a feeling. Love is sacrifice. Jesus demonstrates for us. He shows us this is what love looks like, and it's on the cross. And so we're called, love each other like that. Well, let's look at the next one. Dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. So what we see is, is that the sacrificial love of Jesus pouring through my life is actually evidence of my salvation. Everyone who loves has been born of God. In other words, when you're saved, when you put your faith in Jesus, and if you haven't yet, can I just tell you something? He loves you. Surrender yourself to him. Receive eternal life. Be saved. It's all taken care of. All you have to do is receive it. Believe and receive by faith. And then what happens is, is you're regenerated. That literally means to be born again. Remember when Jesus says, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And remember what Nicodemus says is, how can I climb up back in my mother's womb and be born again? Like that's kind of a graphic, sickening thought. But nonetheless, Nicodemus' mind went there. Like, how can that happen? Certainly his mom wasn't going to be a fan of that. Like I gave birth to you once when you were like seven pounds. Did you know that I was nine pounds, 10 ounces when I was born? I just never grew into my head. I started off with a lot of potential and this is it. I want you to catch something here though. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God because love comes from God. Catch this now. This is important. When you believe and you're saved, Romans 5, 5, God puts his spirit in you and he deposits his love in you. So the reason we're told in scripture that love is the evidence of your salvation is because God's supernatural love coming through you would not be from you if it hadn't been deposited in you. That does not come naturally to the sinful human being. Okay, there's this lady named Phoebe in Romans chapter 16, verse one. Phoebe was what many people believe like the first deaconess. She's actually referred to you that way. But Paul calls her something else. She, he calls her a servant, diakonos in the Greek, but then he calls her a patron, which is interesting. A patron means a benefactor. So what it means is, is that Phoebe was, was wealthy and she was sponsoring, serving Paul, but she was also sponsoring his missionary journeys, which I know Joanna would say this too. When you support missionaries, you're actually taking part in the work that they're doing. You're doing it from here, but any fruit that comes, you get part of that reward. That's biblical. But Phoebe, the first person Paul mentions in his little thank you last part of Romans chapter 16, calls her a patron. Now think with me for just a minute. The only reason Phoebe could write checks to support Paul's ministry, they didn't write checks then. They also didn't use cards either for that matter or whatever we do now, Zell. Yeah, they, they didn't do Zell. But the only reason Phoebe could write checks for Paul's ministry is because God had made deposits in her physical bank accounts. Did you, did you realize this? Every good and perfect gift is from above. If you have money in your bank account, it's not because you work so hard to earn it. God's given it to you. Like everything you possess, you have to see it as like, oh, this is actually not even mine. It's his. I'm a steward of it. Like, whoa. But the only reason Phoebe could support Paul's ministry is because God had supported her to support Paul's ministry. Now, this is not a financial conversation I'm having you with you right now. What I'm saying is if you have supernatural love to give to others, it's because God has deposited that in you. And if you're a follower of Jesus, the deposit has been made so you can freely make withdrawals. That's why John says that's evidence of your salvation. The evidence that you're rich is that you can give away a lot of money. You might want to give away a lot of money, but if you don't have a lot of money, you can't. What's the old phrase? You can't take blood from a turnip. I'm not exactly sure sometimes where we come up with these figures of speech. I like looking those up. I didn't look that up because I wasn't planning on saying it. But the idea is like, no, but when, so when Jesus comes and he says, love your enemies, his commandments are his enablements. You're like, well, I can't love my enemies. You don't, have, you don't understand my enemies. And I'm like, no, then you don't understand the love of God. 
Like the deposit he made allows you to do that. Ladies, love supernaturally. Don't just love in the natural. Love supernaturally. And then uh, notice the next one, second to last one. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment. That's important right there. And whoever fears has not, has not been perfected in love. What he's talking about here, the word punishment, he, I, I believe what's happening here is he's reminding them that one day all human beings have to give an account of themselves for God, to God, for their behavior. The Bible says the books will be opened. But if you're in Christ, because of his perfect love for you, everything you've ever done has been erased. So perfect love casts out fear. So we approach the throne of grace with boldness and confidence because we know of the love of God. The love of Jesus in my life has removed the fear, not the reverence for God, but the dread of meeting him. It's appointed a man once to die and then face judgment. But for all of us who are in Jesus, Jesus is there and he's my representative, he's my advocate, and he says, Father, those sins are paid for. I pay for them on the cross. So I don't have to fear any longer. I, I get asked to pray oftentimes in public places. I prayed at the 4.0 dinner at the fairgrounds last Tuesday night, a week ago Tuesday. And um, sometimes I've been asked not to pray in Jesus' name, not to mention Jesus' name. And I, I just say, well, that's going to be a problem. Because it's just going to come out. Like I can't actually stop myself. I can't actually help myself. It's just going to come out. I remember one time I was asked to do a funeral and I'm always honored to do that. I'll do one tomorrow. And, and the, the family asked, could you just not make it religious? I said it just like this too. I'm like, actually, even if I would, I can't. And I said, I, I said this to them. I said, do you know who Tommy Lasorda is? Oh yeah, old Dodger manager. Yeah. He used to say that if you cut him, he bleeds Dodger blue. I said, you cut me, I bleed Jesus. Jesus has come pouring out. Can't help it. Because he's poured himself in. And, and they said, oh, just do whatever you need to do. <laughs> I said, okay. And afterwards, they were, oh, thank you so much. You know, just. But why do I insist on praying in Jesus' name? Why do I do that? It's not because I think it's the magic formula, although he did say if you ask anything in my name, that means according to his will, <laughs> it will be done. According to his character and his will, that's what to pray in his name means. But, but it's really the only way a sane person would approach a holy God. It's insane to approach the holy God of the universe who cannot look upon sin with favor, who hates sin, to approach him in any other name. So when I pray in the name of Jesus, what I'm saying is, Father, just here to kind of remind you that you told me I could approach the throne of grace with the throne of grace with boldness and confidence because of the finished work of Jesus. Just want to remind you, I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Do you remember Esther in the Bible? Queen Esther? Remember when Mordecai, her cousin, comes, or her uncle, we don't know which one, and just says, Esther, you got to know the king, you know, through um, surreptitious sort of false lies is going to kill the Jewish people. And, and, and you got to go speak up to him. You're the queen. And she goes, do you know what can happen to the person who approaches the king? You see, because in ancient times, you couldn't just approach a king. And then and remember, remember how that story goes. Then he says to her, he says, well, if you don't go, God will use somebody else. But could it be that God has put you here for such a time as this? But the whole point of that story is you can't approach the God of the universe in an unholy way and think you're going to survive it. So I pray in Jesus' name because when I pray in Jesus' name, I'm saying, Father, I approach you based on the finished work, the atoning sacrifice of your son, Jesus. You invited me to come. I have an invitation. I've been made clean. So notice... There's no fear in love. And when that love is perfected, that means when that love comes to maturity in our lives, the longer we live, the closer we get to our Lord, the more we grow in our affection for him, the more we're aware of his love, the less we fear. Not the less respectful we are to him, the less we fear him. Like we don't fear his doom, his judgment, his condemnation. There's acceptance there. There's also great respect. He is the God of the universe. I don't talk to him casually, but I want to talk to him intimately. Okay, like, like, it's not disrespectful. Like, it's like this. Like, okay, my grandkids, who, who just are such a, a delight and a blessing, um, they're, 
they, they swarm like to, to us. They love us. I just saw, I was up front over there kicking off the Awana thing, and here comes my little grandson. Well, my granddaughter Ellie comes running up first, six years old. She doesn't care. They don't, they don't care that I'm the pastor here. They don't, I'm, I'm their pop pop. <laughs> they don't care. They don't care what I'm doing. She just comes running up. I'm like, hey, hey, you know, like whatever. And then here comes Jack with his little Bass Pro Shop hat on. He's not even two years old. He's got a broken arm. He's got his little cast. And he's just like, <laughs> like, ah. But I will also tell you this. Their parents will not let them be in any way disrespectful to their pop-up and gaga. So are we approachable? Yes. Can they just treat us any way they want? Their parents won't have it. <laughs> even last night, the smallest little things. Nora was over our house and she picks a flower off of our flowers and then, uh, which I said, that's fine. I would give her anything. She could have the whole plant. I'll take it out by the roots. I don't care. She pulls a flower off and she goes, I want a purple one. That was no big deal. I'm like, oh, go get a purple one. And, and CJ's like, Nora, you say, please, Pop-Pop, can I have a purple one? What is, she, what is he teaching her? That's your Pop-Pop, but you respect him. That's my Pop, but I respect him. Perfect love, though, casts out fear. Maybe you're trying to overcome fear and anxiety, maybe even in your approach to God. Can I tell you what you, the best way to overcome that is? Focus on the love that God has for you. Perfect love casts out fear. The last one. For this is the love of God, I love this, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Jesus says that in John chapter 14, verse 21. If you love me, you'll obey my commandments. And that's not burdensome. In other words, we're delighted to do it. Like, oh, no, I, I so, I'm, gr I'm so grateful. I so embrace your love for me. Like whatever would please you. Remember Jesus in John chapter four, he's doing all this great work and the disciples come to him thinking he must be hungry. He hasn't eaten all day. And they come to him like trying to bring him food. And he goes, I've already eaten. And they're going, what is he eating? We haven't seen him eat all day. And he goes, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. That's my heart's delight. I also think this idea, I think Kristen taught on this actually, this idea of his commands aren't burdensome. What I think what it can mean too is like when we obey, you know, sometimes the devil tries to show us like it's so hard to obey and if you obey, there's great reward in obedience. Like there's joy in it. Like this, not, that's not the burden. Can I just testify in my own life? The burden in my life is disobedience. The guilt that comes, the consequences that come, the shame that come, that I didn't trust him. I'm like, ah, there's no burden when he's the love of your life. It would be like you get your kids a, a gift they've always wanted and you deliver that gift. I remember when scooters were really, I remember scooters, maybe you don't, remember, scooters were like the thing and they sold them at Costco and you had to have a scooter. This is the weirdest thing how we do that. We all copy each other. Like everybody had a scooter, everybody's trying to get scooters. Like, like, like nobody's had scooters ever or they'll never be scooters again. This is the year of the scooter. And I remember my kids, they opened those up. What were they, Razor scooters? Oh, Man, looking back on it now, I mean, we got those early. We could have sold them for triple the price. I should have done that and just told the kids Christmas was the 27th and I could have got them discounted, whatever, made some money. But when they opened those, you guys, honestly, my dad's heart, I'm like, oh, they love their scooters. Your, your dad in heaven, he feels that way about you. He's not a cosmic killjoy. He hasn't given you commands that are meant to ruin your life. He wants to lighten your load. His commands aren't burdensome. And when you, when you say, I just love you. I want to do this because I love you. It takes away legalism. It takes away all the traps out of our mind. Like, and you can just get to the end of the day, like, Father, I just pray that today you felt my love through my obedience. Mm. This is lady in the Bible. I don't know, maybe you've heard of her. Her name was Mary. I think it's the most common woman's name on the planet, actually. Mary was a young virgin, and this angel appears to her and says, you're going to have a baby. And Mary goes, I'm sorry, could you, could you say that? Could you, did you say I'm going to babysit? <laughs> no, you're going to have a baby. And she goes, well, that, that's not possible. Well, what do you mean? That's not, well, well, you say I'm, I'm a virgin. Like, like. Like God needed that information. 
But I love this. I love, I love how this section, I hope you don't miss this when you think about Mary, this precious teenage girl who just loved her God. And it was expressed through her obedience and her willingness. And the angel says, well, this is how it's gonna go down. You're gonna be overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. And this is gonna be a supernatural conception. And you're gonna give birth to the one who will sit on David's throne forever, the promised Messiah. God's coming to the earth through your womb to rescue man from sin. Do you guys remember Mary's response? Here it is, ready? Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. The evidence of Mary's love for God was demonstrated in her obedience to God. Behold, I'm a servant of the Lord. Whatever you desire, Lord, I love you. That's not a burdensome command. I think it probably was a bit of a burden, wasn't it? To be a teenage girl pregnant in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. You think that maybe was a little stigma that came along with that? You think maybe a little tarnished reputation? But, but yet it wasn't burdensome to her. And what I want you to catch is this. Because she obeyed out of her love for God, her devotion to him, forever, her name will be called Blessed. She gave birth to the Son of God. And so, it wasn't burden that came from obedience, it was blessing. I mentioned that I talked the other night. I talked, they asked me to. They, they said, would you pray, but would you share some words first? And they, they asked me to do that every year. There's a couple thousand people at the fairgrounds. I always get to go first, which I like, because I get to go first, and then I get to go home. But I get to get the first word out. And one of the things I shared with them, I'm gonna share with you. And it's a Max Lucado quote. And it goes like this. If God had a wallet, your picture would be in it. And if God had a refrigerator, your photo would be on it. Do you believe that? Oh, do you know his love for you? If you do, and you know that love, then the call of John is, is walk in that love, abide in Christ, and then allow that love to flow you, through you into the lives of everybody around you. And then therefore, God will be loving people through you. And that won't be a burden. That'll be a joy because it's better to give than to receive. And it will be evidence of your own salvation. Like that didn't come from me. There's no way. The old Chris Johnson would have never done that. So some of you ladies, um, I made this pretty so you would hang it on your refrigerators. And some of you have written on it. You're like, well, that's messed up now because like I said, men would hang it on there. But, but here's the thing. I see some tables from some ladies that are over there. So feel free to grab a new one. Maybe you just stick this in your Bible. Maybe just for the next month, you just review these verses. Pretty soon, maybe you'll actually have them pretty much memorized. And then the Holy Spirit can pull those up at just the right moment. Can I tell you tonight, God loves you. I'm going to pray. And then I'm going to have you listen to a song. And Morgan, if you would, just play that song to the four minute mark. There's a downside of that song. You can just lower the volume when the lyrics go off. It's a song um, that I personally worship too often. One of my favorite ways to worship and to pray is I'll put on worship music to start. This is one of those songs. And I'll just close my eyes. Sometimes before I read my Bible, sometimes after, and just say, Father, I just, I just want to spend a little time with you right now. And this song helps to prepare my heart, but the song's really about the love of God and that love of God sinking deep into our hearts and being overcome by that love and the fear then vanishing away, the fears of our life. Like, if he's for me, who can be against me? And so I just wanted to give you a chance tonight to have a moment of worship and to reflect on God's love for you, to, to invite him, to love others through you. Like, make me a vessel, a blessing, even around the tables tonight. So take a few minutes, just worship, enjoy his presence, feel and soak up his love. Know that if God had a wallet, your picture would be in it. And if he does, it already is. Let me pray and then we'll listen to this song. Father, thank you for your great love. 
I pray tonight that every lady in this room would know how high and wide and long and deep the love of Christ is for her. That you have called her your daughter. Lord, we've been forgiven much and we want to love you much. Tonight I pray that these ladies would know that you love them and that you would love others through them. In Jesus' name, amen.